Hey, what's happening all you dudes and dudettes? This is Dudes Talking Freedom back at you once again. This is Luke. And I'm Jeremy. And we want to thank you for joining us on the Dudes Talking Freedom podcast. We're brought to you by Warriors for Freedom, a nonprofit that creates pathways to engage service members to help veterans and their families prevent suicide, foster camaraderie, and help them live their best lives. Check them out at warriorsforfreedom.org. All right, folks, we have Susan Kershaw, who is running for Frisco ISD Place 5 Board of Trustees, and we'll be talking education and whatever else we want to talk about. So let's get into it, shall we? Susan, welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. We are thrilled to have another school board candidate in the house. Yeah, and we're lucky that uh, she didn't run away because she rang the door and, uh, you know, the attack dog went absolutely ballistic. Yeah, sorry about that. <clears throat> there is a sign out front. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, luckily, I'm not afraid of too much, so. Yeah. It makes me good for the school board and running for, you know, being in the campaign business. Yeah. These days. Running from vicious dogs. Right. <laughs> yeah, I bet you get a lot of that when you're knocking on doors. A lot of dogs barking like the mailman. For sure. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Well, I apologize. My, uh, we, we should have told you to come around to the side to the garage, but we forgot. So yeah. Callie went nuts. I heard her barking. I, I made a beeline for inside. The kids were all like, someone's at the door. Yeah, I heard that too. I knew I was in the right place. <laughs> That's right. That's really good. Uh, well, uh, we appreciate you coming on. Uh, you know, we've had, uh, a whole bunch of local school board candidates joining us over the past, uh, well, I mean, it started a little over a year ago and more recently we've, we've had a number of local, uh, candidates here in Prosper and, you know, we're, we're branching out. Obviously Frisco has a big election coming up and, um, you know, you're running for place five, the board of trustees in Frisco. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for school board this year? All right. Well, how much, how, how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> well, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you could start a little bit about like why you're running. All right. And then also after that, you could maybe, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about your background and like what, you know, you know, makes you qualified for the for the role all right well let's see so i've got children in the school district and i am acutely aware of the things that are going on in this in the school district that we love we've been a part of frisco for 17 years uh, we've got uh, two middle schoolers 13 and 12 years old and we've just had an enchanted experience with frisco isd we moved to frisco from dallas because of the schools and um uh, Came to Frisco really for the just a wonderful family friendly environment that you know Frisco's worked so hard to achieve. Um, we wanted to be a part of that. So the elementary school experience was just wonderful. Everything about it, everything about it, and we just couldn't believe our luck really. And um, I, I know a lot of the schools out here are really wonderful too. Um, we just fell in love with the place though. It's grown a lot. It's grown a lot, and we've seen a lot. So um, seventeen years. Yeah. But uh, so, and now they're in middle school. And so some things have changed. You know, when COVID brought some changes and we've all heard what COVID has done, it's allowed the parents to, you know, kind of see the curriculum and see what's going on. I really enjoyed a lot of that though. Um, You know, I felt like I was back in school too. So a lot of, it was a good experience. Yeah. And Frisco did a good job um, bringing on, you know, keeping the children engaged and keeping them in their curriculum uh, during the COVID um, months, I guess when they had that opportunity to be um, at home and on their devices and that kind of thing and, and have that uh, connection with their teachers and their classmates and that kind of thing. So they, they jumped through some hoops and got seen, got a lot done for the students, and it was a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the Chromebooks just never went away, and the textbooks never came back. And um, so it was, there were some things. Um, my children went into middle school, and um, one day my son hopped in the car and let me know that they were passing around these kids were passing around uh, basically, essentially, a sex book in the school library. Oh, boy. Yeah. And so this is my child that's just, he's my heart. He's a good kid. And he, what grade was he in at the time? Sixth grade. Yeah. That's... 12, 12 year old child. And he was That'll alerting me. You know, he was alerting me. It's pretty sad when the children um, have more wherewithal than the adults in the room. 
and you kind of, mm-hmm. you know, you have to assess what's really going on there. Yeah. And so, but I initially, you know, you have to trust, you know, this is a school, school district that we love. We love our teachers. We love, you know, the principals and vice principals and counselors and, you know, all of the staff. Um, so you just have to think that something's, there's got to be a mistake. Something's wrong. He's got it wrong. It's a mistake. Something's wrong. And you want to give them the benefit of the doubt, right? So um, I let my child, who's, you know, he's never lied to me. I'm one of these. I'm doing air quotes in there. Um, but, you know, I believe my child. And, but I did tell him, you know, I'm going to have to, I'm just going to have to see this to believe it because it's got to be a pamphlet or something that some kid brought from school or from home. It's got to be a, you know, a book that some other kid brought from home. This cannot, you cannot be provided, you know, an all out sex book. Yeah, go to the library. source, right? You don't want to rely on hearsay. Right. Or you get too excited because <laughs> right. yeah, everybody's done that a few times. Right. So um, the kid checked it out and brought it home. And he, you know, so I seared my retinas and read the book. And it's, it's an, it's everything, you know, it's, this book was a, um, it was a, it was a biography of an individual who lives in London, it's never been on this continent, but it was a biography of an individual who wanted to change their gender from you know, one to the other and grow a beard. And so take all the hormones and, you know, so a little bit about my background. I, I've got a business degree. I'm a first generation college graduate. I'm from um, a beautiful little town in Northeast Mississippi and um, put myself through school, you know, did it the hard way, worked my way through, worked on the weekends, uh, worked every holiday all summer, saved my money, learned the difference between what I need, what I want. And I still live that way. So I'm fiscally responsible, that kind of person. I have no debt. And um, that's a little bit about me. Um, But I love science and I wasn't really using my science. And so about 13 or 14 years after I finished that um, business degree, I went back and got a nursing degree. And so I walked right into surgical trauma ICU and in a level one trauma center and spent 12 years as a surgical trauma ICU nurse. And so that gives you a lens of how to, you know, just really how to see things around you. And so I see things in, you know, facts and science and I see things in legalities and I see things in our privacy rights and our legal rights and, you know, what's right and what's wrong generally and what's proper and what's, you know, um, just what makes sense. What's in the best interest of your patient, you know? Well, for sure. Right. They have their, their patient rights and their patient rights are rights that just make sense. And it's legal rights, but it's just, it's, it's what makes sense. And it's really what you would want. It's everything that we would expect. Uh, so so back to the book. So I'm seeing things, um, you know, it's, it's, I understand like a reproductive cycle, a science book. That's not what this was. You know, this wasn't like, you know, we got cardiovascular system, respiratory system, bio, you know, reproductive system. No, no, no. This was an all-out sex book. Yeah. This was how to go onto Instagram and, you know, learn the lifestyle of how to use your uh, sex toys and with adolescents and, you know, and how to hopefully avoid STDs and a lot of information, how to go on um YouTube, YouTube channel was provided to my 12-year-old child, uh, nice. how to go online and buy sex toys and buy them yourself and have them shipped to you. For a 12-year-old. Oh, yeah. And all this was in this book? Yes. How, how many pages was this book, I roughly? Don't, I don't know. You don't know? Well, probably a couple hundred. I was just curious. It like, wasn't a, it was a book. Yeah. <laughs> it was a book book. Yeah. And so, and also, back to me being a nurse, so I'm think, seeing things from this lens. Well, this person in this book, the writer, talked about cutting themselves. So, you know, that's a cutter, you know, that's a psychological. So I'm seeing things from a back to the science. I'm seeing things, you know, that's a psychological break that this person was having. And I'm waiting, I'm reading the book and I'm waiting for something to come up about some type of psychological mitigation or mediation or some sort of, you know, self, you know, self-awareness of this person. This isn't normal and this isn't right. And they needed some kind of intervention. None of that happened. There was no intervention. Um, So that's what we call normalizing. You know, this isn't normal. Yeah. And I don't want my child to think that, you know, mutilating their body is normal. Yeah. And so, but that's what this person did. And they went further and mutilated themselves as top surgery. And they talked about bottom surgery and they talked about a lot of things that were just highly inappropriate. And so, um, this was a crime. We've got Texas penal code 43.24 is essentially says we cannot expose minors to obscene material. Mm-hmm. And the word obscene means what the community says it means community standard. 
We've got Texas Education Code. It says that the parents are to be full partners with the educators in the education of their children. I would assume that means library material, too. Well, right now we've got um, we've got um, Jared Patterson, thankfully, yep. and he's taking, Jared, yeah. yep, he's taking care of some things for us, and Matt Shaheen. And they're, um, they're both, you know, looking into this and um, they're writing bills and they're partnering on these bills. And we've got House Bill 900 that's in the works. And I support that bill. And that essentially what that bill will do for us is it will have the vendors of these book companies um, rank the books, like kind of like the movies are, you know, rated R, rated mm-hmm. PG-13. Okay. So these books will be ranked. And so, um, they, yeah. so a book like what I'm talking about will not make its way to a middle school because of the ranking hopefully in the future. But the cat's out of the bag. My child's been exposed to it. Um, I was able to figure out how to, um, you know, manage the policy per protocol and object to this material. And based on the fact that it's got no redeeming qualities to it, it's inappropriate for my child or any child that's 12 years old or 13, 14, you know, that's in the middle school. And um, I would argue also high school. I mean, I, I I think, I think it's like, if you can't, Buy alcohol till you're 21. You can't buy cigarettes till you're 18. You can't vote till you're 18. You're not smart enough to do any of those things mm-hmm. until you're older. Mm-hmm. We've said this on the show before. Kids are kind of dumb until they're <laughs> educated and older. Right. <laughs> you know, right. like I was an idiot until I was out of college. You know, I did a lot of stupid things mm-hmm. growing up and all through college, I continued to do stupid things. I even did stupid things as an adult for a little while, you mm-hmm. know, and, until I got older, more mature and stopped doing stupid stuff. And, you know, I just think kids are too young to be making those decisions about mutilating their bodies and, you know, conversion therapy or whatever you want to call it is, I think they're just too young to be making those choices and, yeah. and they shouldn't certainly be, shouldn't be introduced to the concept I totally agree. Uh, yeah, it's like the D.A.R.E. program, right? Like, yeah. they brought along the D.A.R.E. program, and all kinds of kids wanted to do drugs after that, mm-hmm. you know? And they know marketing works, advertising works. Yeah. And when you put books in libraries that suggest to cut off your penis or grow a beard if you're a woman or whatever, right? Like, all these things, people are going to want to try it. Yeah. Now, maybe not your son, right? Because he's got a solid, you know, family mm-hmm. core. Uh, to run home to or to yeah. walk home to or ride his back, whatever he does, <laughs> you know, Roll the blade. <laughs> he runs blade, you know, whatever he does, skip, pop, jump, whatever. Yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of people that don't have that. Yeah. And for a variety of reasons, you know, I mean, you got to work really hard in order to like pay your mortgage around here and just, you know, keep a family going. So, I mean, I don't know. It's a tough balance. Yeah. There's an attack on the family structure for sure. There's definitely an attack on the family structure and they're, and and they, I use air quotes as well. They, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whoever they are, but they know who they are and they're coming after the family structure and they're trying to break up the family structure and they're trying to separate the children from the parents as much as they can so that they can indoctrinate or at least provide the children with some direction as to what they think is okay and, you know, get that separation in place because if the children aren't getting that solid family foundation, then they're more likely to do things that they're more likely to. So what I'm looking for, uh, they're impressionable, right? very impressionable yeah. at that point. And, and you can impress upon them whatever it is you would like. Right. So, Books like that have no place in the school. And kids are naturally uh, looking to people other than their parents uh, once they turn 13, you know. And from like 13 to 24, which happens to be the historical peak fertility ages, mm-hmm. um, is kind of a is kind of a system that our bodies have been put in place over time, like an evolutionary, not necessarily evolutionary, but like to help people avoid incest essentially. Yeah. So they think their family's dumb and your family can say this one thing and then your friend's parents can say the exact same thing and they believe it because it's coming from a different family. Right. And it's kind of a learned behavior over time to mitigate the risks of like, you know, incest essentially. Well, I'm just grateful that he came to me and he let me know. He definitely, he came, he came to me to let me know it was an alert. Right. And, you know, so um, I, so I jumped through the hoops and alerted the school and was essentially ignored. And um, there's a whole story there you don't hear. It's just, it's so long. It's just, I was just in a state of disbelief, though, absolute state of disbelief. 
that, you know, our, our school, you know, this is, you know, it's me, you know, it's yeah. me, you know, I'm Susan, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a mom, you know, yeah. I'm, do the right thing. Just get the book out. You know, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And they were like, well, we can't just get the book out. You're going to have to, you know, formally, uh, you know, object to this. That, that in and of itself is mind blowing to oh, me that yeah. they wouldn't just be like, you know what, this slipped through the cracks. You're right. Yeah. You should remove this right. because this has no business being in the school. Mm -hmm. And I'm not surprised because I've heard enough stories mm -hmm. about this all over the country. I mean, we've interviewed uh, a friend of mine from Connecticut who was like front and center with the whole like scandal with like being the, on the parents list with the FBI. And like she, she was telling us some stories about what was going on up there in Connecticut. I've heard stories about what's happening in California and other schools throughout the country. And it's, it's, I, when she told me, Hey, it's going to, if it's already in Texas, you just don't know about it yet. And I kind of was like, I don't know, like really Texas, like we moved here for a reason and mm -hmm. like it's here. Oh, and, yeah, it's here. and over it's the past here. couple of years, like you said, since COVID it's exposed a lot of that, you know, kind of ugly part of what's going on in these schools. And like, teachers may not even be aware of it either. Right. And like you said, like we love our teachers too. We love our teachers. We love our principals. And, you know, most of them are, are great. Some of them maybe, you know, not so great, but most of them are great. And the books, like that should just be like a black and white thing. Like, Hey, you know what? This is not appropriate for an 11, 12, 13, 18 year old kid. Mm -hmm. Get it out of the schools. If a child above the age of 18 who is officially an adult can vote you know buy cigarettes or whatever can and, and wants to go to a library and check out a book like that if it's in a public library okay in the adult section fine yeah these books are in the library in the public library but they're not in the children's section yeah that that, that alone is like it, it, why it's would it common be common sense yeah, it is very, just very much obvious so. yeah. yeah yeah they don't care yeah. they, don't they care. shouldn't have ever arrived there too there should be a screening process should be should be should be um, they know that they're there. It's easy. You can pull up with your phone right now. You go into the district website, go into departments, hit library, go into library catalog, and it pulls up a search engine. So you can pull up any kind, any school in the district that you want, um, and then you can search their library catalog by topic. You know, wow. if it's rock climbing, if it's sex, you know, yeah. whatever. Pull up, you know, whatever. And so, yeah, it's it's kind of scary what you can find in a middle school in Frisco. There's just so much information out there. So much other, so many other topics that you can possibly be exploring. Like yeah. why waste time on this? You know, I felt like my child was ambushed and what he said, because it's not like it's in a certain area where they can go to a certain area and find it. They're just distributed all, all around the library. And so, but what he said was they, um, that there were children there. There were other children there passing the book around and they were, these children, these were 12 year old little boys, sixth grade. And this is what's so sad. They were so embarrassed and mortified about this book. They were literally trying to hide it under a bench in the library so other children would not find it. Mm. These are little... Good for them. I know. Yeah. Little kids doing this, um, having more wherewithal and more really integrity than the adults in the building. That's shameful. Um, I mean, shame on the adults that have supposedly have supposed to have I don't want to throw them all under the bus. I mean, yeah. I have been thanked by, so, by yeah. them for... Um, reviewing other books and just they roll their eyes up to heaven and thank me. These people, they've got their hands tied. Well, you know? someone is making the call. Someone's making the call. And shame on that person or people well, who are making the call. There was a librarian at a school here in Prosper. I read uh, this uh, parent, their kid was given the, a bag with a book, a mystery book in it, and they were supposed to read it and give a report on it and bring it back. Right. So this I kid's daughter this or son, their, their child got this bag and it happened to be one of these gender dysmorphic books. I've, right? heard, like, I've heard this before. So, I mean like that mm -hmm. is like a clearly planted, I, I don't know how much more planted you could get than that. And that yeah. girl's clearly an agent for, you know, just torment. Yeah. Essentially, I mean, it's just so, so you can't warfare. undo it. Yeah, you can't unsee these things. So, no, so that's, that was the impetus for you saying, you know what, I'm going to run. Well, that wasn't no. Or one, one <laughs> so of the things what, that what that to. what that did for me was that um, caused me to reach out and to talk a lot. 
and to I've I became part of a mom's group. So really, I call it a mom's group, but we're we're a mama bears group, and but it consists of fathers and it consists of grandparents, and we're just really really concerned, and we um, we care about these children, we care about our future, we care about you know, all the kids in our community, and we have that you know that discernment about you know choosing what's right from wrong and what's true from false and and um, you know these things they they don't make sense and you know me being a practical you know nurse um, you know an ICU nurse you know I like to make sense of things I like for things you know you've got that critical thinking skill that you've got about you and uh, this just doesn't make sense to me so it's either it's either just complete incompetence and I don't think that's it I think it's I think I think among some groups there's got to be some nefarious just some some really evil doers in our society that are just trying to, you know, usurp the power of the parents and the control of really the school. Um, yeah, that's been my argument mm-hmm. for a while. It's it's not it's not the people in the schools. It's the system that they're a part of, mm-hmm. and the system is broken, mm-hmm. um, and it's broken by design. That's mm-hmm. my personal opinion. Um, you know, take that for whatever you want, but. I personally think that there is a group of, of people in very high posi- places of power that want to destroy the concept of the family. Uh, they want to destroy things like Christian values. They want to destroy, uh, you know, they, they want kids to, you know, these impressionable youth to get exposed to things that, didn't exist, you know, weren't even conceptually a thing, you know, decades ago. Um, but they, they want that because then they can control. It's all, it's all under the, the uh, guise of control, being able to control the population, being able to control people at an early age and drive them towards certain outcomes. And the teachers, right, and the, and the people who, you know, the administrators and all these folks, they're not necessarily bad people, right? They just are a product of the system and they are part of that system. And so, like you said, their hands were tied, mm-hmm. right? They may want to get rid of that book, but they can't because the, the hoops that they have to jump through preclude them or prevent them from doing so. Mm-hmm. And so you got to take a different approach. And like, no one knows what that approach is because we're all just finding this stuff out over the last couple of years and learning about it and understanding that this system is broken and that there are these mechanisms that have been put in place to do all those things I just mentioned. And so, uh, you know, kudos to you and and all these other school board candidates that that are standing up and, and running for these trustee roles because, you know, we need more people like you to do so and raise your hand and say, look, like this is wrong and we need to address it and we need to fight back and we need to figure out how to prevent this from continuing to happen. Right. So I hear both of you guys talking about uh, essentially this quote from Texas Association of School Boards uh, found on the TASB school law e-source under powers and duties of the school board. And what they feel is the following. Uh, Most elected officials equate being elected with representing a voting constituency. In Texas, however, school board trustees are not like other public office holders, such as city council members, state legislators, or county commissioners. Once elected, a school board trustee serves on a body corporate, and the board's constituency is the district itself, not a group of voters. The trustees are called upon to serve the needs of the district and its school children as a whole, not the wishes of a particular block of voters, even in a single member district. To meet this end, the Texas legislature has adopted a governance structure unique to the public education environment. Now, mm-hmm. you know, that's pretty unsettling for me to hear, uh, for sure. But, um, about the most undemocratic thing you can think of, right? Yeah. Mm. Like, what's what's the deal here? It's even driven Carrollton ISD to leave uh, TASB, right? Mm-hmm. So I guess, what do you think about Carrollton leaving? What do you think about that statement? And do you think Frisco ISD should leave TASB, uh, leave the TASB flag? I would be open to it. Listen, I support what they've done. They have the right to do it. This is a voluntary membership of a group. Uh, that we're not required to, to keep and to hold. Uh, we could probably save money, um, you know, going into, you know, having other sources for, say, the insurance 
Um, one of my teacher friends um, pulled out her cell phone and she was showing me a pay stub of another teacher friend of hers. And she said, when I tell you the teachers are working for insurance, we're working for insurance. And it was a picture of the pay stub for that month. And it was like, you know, two week pay stub. And it was like 800 and some odd dollars for the insurance and $13 was left over for this teacher's pay. Oh, wow. Uh, Mm -hmm. For health insurance. Mm -hmm. For, you know, probably a couple members of our family. I'm not really sure how many members, but um, (sighs) so, but we get our insurance through TASB. It's my understanding. And I'd like to see some alternatives to that. Um, You know, we're Frisco. We've got highly trained, you know, professionals there in the district, Um, you know, can make our own policies. We can make our own curriculum. Um, no, we're not subject to you know the whims of the administration or the district. We we serve the the body of our voters. We serve the body of our of our parents. Yeah. We are the liaison between the community and the administration. Mm-hmm. I say we as if I'm part of them, but upon election, that's you know that's a group that I would be a part of. That's what you intend to do. That's exactly what I intend to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of rumors swirl around about the Frisco uh, Board of Trustees that, that there's that they're they I don't want to use the word corrupt, but they're just they all kind of lean in one direction. You've obviously got uh, Stephanie Elad and Marvin uh, Lowe that are more conservative and and kind of stand up and and more fighting for the parents and the and you know what I would argue fighting for the children more so than the rest and mm-hmm. and the rest have these kind of really left leaning liberal idealistic kind of you know mentalities do you mean Renee Archambault Danette Davis and Debbie Gillespie? Uh, hey, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess they, you know, I don't know all their names. I, mean, I, I know those three names because they've been in the news a little bit recently. Yeah, um, they put a big target on their backs, didn't they? They did. At a coffee shop, no doubt, right? Yeah, I saw that video. Um, yeah, so what are your thoughts on that? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of, you know, those rumors swirl around and we hear about them in Prosper and we've been hearing like, hey, like, what's what's happening in Frisco is working its way into Prosper, right? Because mm. a lot of a lot of folks have moved from Frisco to Prosper and, and with that comes, you know, voting direction, policy, you know, uh, support for certain things. Um, you know, what's your what's yeah, your Yeah, they were at a coffee shop that? together discussing topics with certain parents and, you know, I don't have a problem with that. They want to meet with Sure. With parents and discuss whatever they want to discuss. That's that's their that's their thing. That's that's really what they're elected to do, mm-hmm. to be the voice of the parents of the district. Yeah, they should be meeting with parents. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, but it's excluding the other board members and having it on video and audio that they intended to exclude the other board members um, from the conversation, and then also um, uh, putting the meetings at times when the parents couldn't attend. Mm -hmm. Remember, that's what they were saying, that they would move the meetings and they would push off. So certain board members wanted to have certain topics on the agenda. And then uh, the president of our school board was saying, well, I can push this off and I've pushed this off. I've pushed it off for months. She said specifically, you're talking about the, uh, the Marvin had suggested they uh, address the transgender. Was it the bathroom? uh, Bathrooms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Will transgender, Boys that are are dressing as girls or want to become girls going into girls' bathrooms and vice versa, Um, which, you know, as a father of a young girl, I completely wholeheartedly disagree with, like, a a boy, you know, dressing as a woman or thinking they're a woman. I just don't think we should be putting it on the laps of our children to mitigate psychiatric situation of another person, another child. Agreed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean... Whatever is going on with that person, that is between them and their doctor, between the parent, the child, the doctor. Mm-hmm. It, it should not be my child's business mm-hmm. to help you know, mitigate another person's, could be medical situation or psychiatric, whatever the situation is. I just don't, th- I think it's, it's a heavy load to be putting on a child's plate. I agree. Yeah. And then you think about it from also, I'm back to my nurse's lens, um, our children have the right to modesty. You have the right to modesty. As your nurse, I would protect your modesty. In your ICU room, I've had, I can't tell you how many countless patients I've had that are kicking the covers off and there are people walking, you know, around or down the hall and, you know, you're exposing yourself because you've been in a trauma and you're, you know, restrained and ventilated and sedated and you don't know what's going on. You're kicking the covers off and you're exposing yourself. 
I have to protect you from that. Mm -hmm. That's my job, part yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. um, I feel like our children should have their modesty protected as well, including any child who could potentially be roaming into a girl's restroom. You know, he should be protected so much that he's given, um, you know, appropriate appropriate places to go. Let's let the parents, I mean, or rather the adults in the room, start making some decisions that make sense for them, for us. Yeah. Regardless of whatever your problem is, you ought to, these children ought to have, um, you know, a, a single use bathroom so they can go into. Whether it's whatever your situation is, I feel like we should give them the option. You know, who likes using public restrooms anyway? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. I mean, I have a proposal. We keep building all these new schools, spending millions and millions of dollars. Why not just have a, yeah, a block of private restrooms? Separate private restroom that you need a key code for. And if you're a dude that wants to dress like a girl or thinks they're a girl, then you get a private code for that particular restroom, and that's the restroom that you all get to use. Well, or and that, or I'm just saying like a bad hair day or, you know, a girl, you know, a teenage girl, she just... Maybe she doesn't want to go into a, a public restroom yeah. that day or that week. Sure. You know, I mean, let her have her private space. Yeah, any space. of that, right? right? It's like if they need somewhere to go to the, you know, but like in that particular, I'm just saying in the, the transgender piece of well, it. Well, it's worse right? than You're, that. It's worse than that. There's way more going on in these restrooms than uh, a, a boy or whatever in the girls' restrooms. It's um, There's drugs, there's sex, there's violence. These wow. girls, it's reported to me that these girls are holding their bladder. So that means they're holding their urine in their bladder. So they don't want to go into the yeah, bathroom. They don't go. And they will dehydrate themselves so they don't have to go. Oh, my goodness. And now, again, Cause talking that's to a psycho now, that's, now that's, now that's putting psychological yeah. issues onto these other students who don't deserve it. Right. Yeah. So and back to me being a nurse, I can't tell you how many sepsis patients I've taken care of, and we track it right back to their bladder, bladder infection. <sighs> I mean, it gets bad. It's so it's uh, not just that. Oh, there's more. Uh, it's been reported to me, direct testimony from a teacher who no longer works in Frisco, works in a different place. And uh, she was off work one day. She had a doctor's appointment. The teacher did. and But she was home back at home at noon. So in walks her teenage daughter, Frisco student. In walks her teenage daughter. And the mom's like, what are you doing home? And the daughter's like, she had to admit to her mom, I come home every day for lunch um, to use the restroom. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's bad. I mean, they need to bring people in there and just patrol the bathrooms, right? I mean, well, I, I had a, an interview with Dallas Morning News, um, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, and they didn't like my idea of, you know, allowing the parents back into the schools to, um, you know, just to have a presence. You know, we're all vetted. We've all had our background checks, mm -hmm. you know, um, PTA members, that kind of thing. We're all, you know, and uh, but... Dallas Morning News, I, I must have said the word roam the halls or the term roam the halls, and they didn't like that the way that sounded. But I'm talking about, hello, it's called the Watchdog Program, yeah, and it's, right. in, it's in elementary yeah, schools. Yep. You know, and let that you know, carry over into the middle schools and let these parents have a presence. These teachers don't have time for this. Yeah. You know, and I said something about um, monitoring the doorway of the bathrooms, just so that these kids walking in know that they've got, you know, a second set of eyes on them. Yeah. Not on them, but, you know. There's an adult standing outside. There's an adult. They can hear. Right. They, you know, right. it just, it will, it will give them pause. It will give them pause. If they're thinking about doing something they shouldn't be doing. Perfect way to say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But they didn't like that idea. Dallas Morning News oh, didn't because it's too practical. Dallas right. Morning News <laughs> yeah. did not like that yeah. idea. <laughs> they they endorsed my opponent. They didn't endorse me. Oh, yeah. I was shocked. So, Shocking. So right. surprised. <laughs> right. Um, oh man. Um, so okay. So uh, and, uh, are there other reasons why you're running? I mean, those, like obviously. Well, that was couple, just a scratch yeah. of the surface, I know, right? It like so it. right, that was just scratch of the surface. So I had um, become involved in, uh, you know, learning more. And, you know, I'm seeing about, you know, standards-based grading. My, I've got two children in middle school. And my son, he likes to get it right the first time. So he gets the grade that he's after the first time. So he's, a, he's an A student. He's a smart little kid. And my daughter, she's right there along with him. But, you know, if she gets a B, she's like, eh, it's a B. It's good. I'm good. Well, she informed me when she was in sixth grade, and that would make my son in seventh grade, that she needed to go back for relearning. And I'd never heard this before. And I was like, what do you mean relearning? And she goes, well, I'm going to retake the test. I'm like, yeah, well, they do that here. cool, you know, I guess. But, and so I'm asking my son, I'm like, what's up with this relearning and retesting business? And he goes, well, I never had to do that in sixth grade because I get it right the first time. Mm -hmm. So not the case with my daughter. She had to go and relearn. Well, these teachers are having to reteach and retest. And so think about 
that's taking away infringing upon their planning time. They're coming in early. They're staying late. Uh, it's, it's infringing upon. Oh, you know, so they re- actually the teachers actually continue to teach or reteach them. They continue oh, so to here. Re- they don't. They just get to retest. Like if you get below a seventy. The student gets to retake the test and get up to what, like an 80 or an 85 on the set. That's like the highest grade they can get the second time Mm -hmm. around. But the teacher doesn't do any additional teaching of it. You just get to, you know, hopefully better prepare for it Mm -hmm. the second time you take the test. But there's no reteaching. They they required it. At my children's school, there's a requirement that they have to come in and be. I think it's every school is different in Frisco anyway. So, and you could retest up to 100. Or you could retest up to a 90. And my son, um, he alerted me because I had my eyebrow was raised over the whole thing. And he goes, well, it's only to a 90. So that means he still gets his, you know, if he makes a 98 or 100 or whatever, he kind of won't be too penalized if someone retests and retests and retests. They only get a 90. So that's at their school. But they are required to relearn. And it may be different for each teacher. Yeah. But I was told um, that they have to come in and show that they're making an effort to relearn it. But that's just that's just time that the teachers are. It's well, a cog in the system, regardless, and it's debatable. I and mean, then there's a continuum of how large that cog is. Well, right? what it's doing is it's diluting the GPAs of our students. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when uh, when we've got older students that are going to college, we're finding out that these children are being waitlisted down below their GPA peers because they're coming from Frisco ISD. Mm. Mm-hmm. Really. And so uh, I've got one kind of. Um, interesting uh, example it was because i'm a nurse you know someone was telling me that their their child wanted to go to a nursing school at um i'm not going to say the name of the university but but it was a university um in the area that uh wait listed her down below her peers because of frisco and she this girl was like wait 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 i'm homeschooled and they were like ah well they put her right back up Ah. with her peers because that would be a more accurate gpa unlike what's going on in frisco so that we're we're Having our GPAs watered down, diluted is the term they use. So homeschool is considered private school, right? Well, it it, it was good for her. Yeah. So yeah, it's private. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely private. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, Why would you want to go to Frisco ISD then? You know, you're you, there's there's a ceiling put on your abilities to get into colleges. I'm telling you what though. I mean, it's still a wonderful place. My kids, they love it. They love the sports. They love their teachers. They love their, they're they're both in uh, music. My daughter's in orchestra and my son is in band and these directors, they just go above and beyond. I mean, they just, they put all their heart into it and Mm -hmm. yeah, they, they love it. And the sports, I mean, my goodness, my son played football and he just couldn't get enough of it. And it was a big surprise to us that that's something he wanted to do. But these coaches, they put their heart and soul into it. I mean, they're, and I have a kinship with these teachers, you know, I love my service, you know, oriented peers, you know, in different, different areas of the workforce. Um, you know, they're doing it because they love what they're doing. It's an art, it's a craft. Mm-hmm. And I understand them. And they're, they, they just do a fantastic job. My daughter, she's concerned about a couple of her teachers because of the rowdiness in the classrooms. And she's literally concerned about them. She's concerned about, you know, because, you know, these kids talk over the teacher and um, they're rude sometimes and they make, you know, too much noise in the class and interrupt yeah. and that kind of thing. And my daughter thinks that's just rude. And so um, uh, we've got a, we've got a All lot right. of, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of good going on in Frisco. We really, really do. But we've got some work to do. How big are the classes? Well, they should be average? around 22 uh, pupils per teacher. But what's happening is when we lose our teachers, so we're in a, we're, we're hemorrhaging. That's another nursing term, hemorrhaging. Yeah. <laughs> you like that? My, my wife is a nurse. But she is, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hear that. I've heard that yeah. word. Hemorrhaging times, teachers. Many times. Hematomas waiting yeah. to burst. <laughs> So last this time last year, um, when when Stephanie was running, uh, we were you know appalled at the amount of teachers that we had lost the previous year, which was six hundred. Oh. This year the number is eight hundred and sixty. Whoa. Yeah. So Whoa. it's not getting better. So we're trending in a horrible manner. And how many total teachers are there? Well, there's around four thousand four thousand four hundred or so teachers. Wow. So it's this is a twenty percent. 20% That's loss. It's like 860. 12 high schools, right? I think in Frisco or something like that. I think like 14. That's not really that many. Mm-hmm. How many people live in Frisco? It's like, it's like 200,000. I mean, it's uh, got to yeah, be. Yeah, it's up there. It's like, it's just astronomical because of there's just the influx. It's How just many constantly student, coming. Uh, total students? 67,000 students 67, in Frisco. 67,000. So it's almost pretty close to almost triple. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That is unheard of. It's amazing. I grew up in a small town outside of Boston, and there was in my high school maybe, 
maybe 700 kids. And like, this was like early nineties. I mean, maybe 700 kids total just in, just in the high school, one high school in the whole town. There's only one high school in Stillwater. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Foxborough was like, there was like 700, uh, in, in that high school, maybe, oh. maybe if I, 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 I thought it might even be high, it might be closer to like six. I think there's like 150, 100. Frisco's population is 225,000. There you go. That's that's, that's like that. wow, wow. It's a lot of kids. Yeah. There's a lot of kids up here in North Texas, too, you know, and the electives that uh, the ISDs around here offer are incredible. They are, you know, I mean, they really are, and that's that's one of the big shining spots of. Mm-hmm. You know, these districts, these school districts is their electives. Mm-hmm. But yeah. with all that, you know, I mean, you kind of get elective heavy, essentially. You know, you end up investing too heavily in the electives. And it's not that they aren't great, but they can be, you know, they start they start to, uh, you know, eat the math and science portion of uh, the children's curriculum, you know, in the, in the writing and the English uh, parts mm-hmm. of the curriculum that they need to focus on. So I don't know. I think there's a, there's such thing as too much of a good thing, right? Like, yeah. so I don't know where that is and how much we've, you know, maybe we've over invested and overextended ourselves as far as our asset allocation is concerned, but I don't know. I don't well, know they what's have going choices. There, exactly. They have a lot of choices. Yeah. So that's great. Um, the big sister of one of my kids, my son's um, buddies is uh, she's in architecture. I mean, architecture in cool. high school. Oh, it's the neatest thing. I mean, they, they they do a lot of good stuff. Yeah, they yeah. really, really do. They're bringing it for the children, that's for sure. That is cool. Mm-hmm. Um, architecture is, is a very cool uh, cl- uh, class or elective. I, I've never heard of that in a high school. I know. Yeah, that's No, wild. but it is a very long and arduous uh, college degree to obtain. Oh, yeah. I know. Uh-huh. Um, they're just giving them te- like a little taste of different things that may be, you know, interesting well, I actually for them think that's to good go into in college. Because yeah, you know, a little like, pique their interest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nobody good. knows what they want to do. Like, no kids know what they want to be when they grow up. They so, Some do, but most of them, they have no idea what they want to be when they grow up. And they're too young to decide. It's just like they're too young to decide that they, like, if I'm a boy, I'm too young to decide if I am really a girl, really should be a girl. I'm too young to decide what I want to do when I grow up because I don't have enough exposure to all these different things. And then I might end up going off to college and, oh, yeah, I want to be, like, uh, in advertising and I have no exposure to anything else. I've seen a few movies where I've seen Mad Men or whatever and, Mm -hmm. like, I think it's cool and I want to be in advertising and do marketing campaigns and so I go to a business school and I get a marketing degree or maybe I want to be an architect but I've never been exposed to architecture. I don't know anything about engineering, I'm you know, but I'm a good math student but, like, I just have no idea that that's even a thing. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and so I just don't even know if kids are, are exposed to enough. So I think it's great that, that the schools here have a lot of those, those types of programs and electives because it does give a lot of that additional exposure. And I also think, that, like, maybe I'm wrong on this, but I thought that to get into college, you really only need to have like math and learning or learning arts or I'm sorry, English and uh, language arts in order to, you know, be accepted into college. And then all the other stuff is just kind of additive to that. Like science isn't critical. Um, none of those other things are actually critical for college uh, mm. entry. You're ranked by your GPA. Yeah. One thing that I like is they've got um, like certif- cert- certificate programs where you can be like one of the ones, you know, me being a nurse. So they've got a nurse's aide and you can be certified as a nurse's aide in high school. So wouldn't that be, it would have been wow. great for me. Yeah. I waited tables and put my way through my, for my bachelor's degree, but it would have been really cool for me to walk out of high school and have a way to make a living mm. while I'm, you know, getting, putting myself through my bachelor's program. Where'd you wait tables at? <laughs> at Ruby Tuesday in Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, Ruby uh-huh. Tuesday, yeah. Ruby's. <laughs> Good burgers. Nice. Good burgers, right? Yeah, right. Yep. Okay. yep. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think I struggle with uh, what my major and what, career direction I wanted to take when I got to college because I didn't know when I got to college and when you do get to college I feel like you're trying to get used to a whole new way of living you know you're living most of them are leaving home for the first time right Mm -hmm. so I think it's great that these kids are kind of giving some more thought during high school and some more tools and experiences and you know being exposed to different uh, opportunities 
the in directions that they can take their lives in uh, then because they're in a safe space then, you know, they're in a spot that they can uh, kind of think about that and devote some time to some, you know, thought around that idea instead yeah. of when they get to college, when they're very much yeah. focused on a whole well, lot of other things. Yeah. That's sort of being sabotaged for them though. Right now, um, right now we've got this thing going on in Frisco is called the standard based mindset mm-hmm. and standard based um, testing. And so what that is, is it's a, it's a, it's a way, it's a new way of teaching. It's a new way of testing and a new way of grading. And this is part of what's, um, what's diluted the, the grades. But there is a theory that you should not um, punish irresponsibility because that doesn't promote responsibility. Hmm. So when these it's not children, the way I parent. right? I yeah, know. same. So when these <laughs> when these kids go to college, you know, they've they've not been held to a standard of being responsible for themselves in high school. Turning your test in on time, turning your projects in on time, they can turn them in weeks and weeks late. And it and it the worst part is is that it it discounts all of your your son's efforts mm-hmm. who does it right the first Thank time. You. Yes. Like that's who I want to reward. Right. That's, that's who I want to hire. Yes. Yes. I want to hire the person who's going to do the job right the first time. Mm-hmm. I don't want to hire somebody who's going to take three weeks past deadline. And why is that? And he, because you don't want to blow all your money. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, you know, that's and like comes down to all you're basically capital. teaching those, in addition to teaching irresponsibility, you're teaching people to milk the system. Right. right. You're teaching people to milk the system. Right. And, you know, if they're going to do that, right, then you're going to pay for them to go to college and what? Milk their degree and just do the bare minimum to get by. And it's like, you know. Milk your government, milk your neighbor. Yeah, like seriously. You become a succubus. Yeah. Just totally. living off other people. Right. <laughs> Parasite. And you feel terrible about yourself. Yeah, right. But again, this goes back to their design. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's well, you asked want. me why I decided to run. Yeah. So you put all of this in a big snowball, big nutshell, mm. and it's just too much. I mean, my children are in middle school. We don't have a whole lot of time. They're going to be in high school and gone before too long. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 67,000 children. And I mean, there were only really three, there were three people that ran for school board. And that would be myself and Reed Bond and my opponent, Mark Hill. And, um, you know, Kudos to everybody who runs for school. And the Danette Davis, she's running for re-election, but she's mm-hmm. already, and she's an incumbent. But I'm just saying 67,000 people, children, and only three individuals, you know, decided to run. And, um, you know, it's, it's a job. It's yeah. a job to run for school board. It is. It's, you know, time away from your family and your treasure that you've got to throw at it. And, yeah. um, but, you know, we've got to get some policy changes in this school. We've got to get some policy changes and as far as my opponent goes, um, he's collaborating with the ones who've made this policy. They've created the policy, and he's working with them, collaborating with them, fundraising with them. So there won't be a change there. So I will Mark, make a change. Mark is with them. Mark Hill's with them. Danette. He's campaigning with them, going to their fundraisers. But His treasurer has contributed to her campaign. S- okay, so is he running against He's Danette. running against me. And, you, uh, uh, and, and he's collaborating with Danette. Danette. And He's Danette running. is running against Reed. Exactly. Reed's trying to unseat yes. Danette. Got it. Right. And then, um, and now you're, is there a vacancy that's coming up? Is right. that what so you and Mark are running Right. So seat five, for? right. That's a vacancy. So Debbie right. Gillespie, she's the president of TASB mm-hmm. and she's currently on the school board in Frisco. She oh, she's is the retired. president of TASB. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't convenient. that convenient? <laughs> <laughs> so she's, um, she's vacating the seat. Okay. So Mark Hill and I are She's had enough. Competing. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what she's doing. She's mm-hmm. probably, it's been 12 years, so she's yeah. probably just, you know, wanting to pass the baton. It seems like a conflict of interest to me. It does. Frankly, I mean, to be the head of TASB and be on the Frisco School it does. Board of Trustees. Yeah. Well, Those they've got to be on the board of things. some school. So the. In order to be the president to, of TASB? Right. To be a yeah. member of TASB, to oh, be okay. on the board of TASB, you've got to be on the school board. Oh, okay. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Well, it still seems weird, but. It should be like a separate governing body, I feel like, that doesn't. So there is no conflict of interest, but maybe, I don't know. So it works. Yeah, mm-hmm. I guess. Yeah. If it's an associate, I guess if it's the Association of School to Boards, it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I guess. Change TASB or leave TASB. Those are your, 
Those are your choices if you don't like what Tasby's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Tasby hasn't always been this way. I don't, I don't believe so. Um, I mean, I've been in contact with school board uh, members from the 90s and other that were members of school boards from other areas, and they love Tasby. They love the training that they get from Tasby. And I'm sure Tasby still has good training um, for, for, you know, different positions in different, you know, areas of school board uh, roles and, you know, obligations and different different things that, that school board members do. But, um, you know, what you just read about TASB being subject to the whims of the um, administration versus, you know, the parents in the community, that's, that's, a, that's something that no one agrees with. Right. Yeah. So. I mean, if you do... It sounds terrible, but you could come to the same conclusion regardless of what they say, you know. Right. What is in the best interest of, of children happens to be what my constituents are saying, right? Like, right. depending on your viewpoint. Well, do you know that the, that the National School Board Association, um, they were the ones who said that the parents speaking out at school boards around the nation, this is back during like COVID, during the masks and stuff when parents were up in arms about their children being masked and the things that were going on with the schools at the time. And so the National Association of School Boards um, put out a press release and put out, I guess, a letter to the um, Merrick Garland, you know, United States Attorney General, that um, that they claimed that they believed those parents would be should be considered domestic terrorists. Yeah, that's what I was saying, my friend in Connecticut. Like she right. was okay. she like her and her people up there like were on that list because she's like we're fighting back against school masking and mm-hmm. all the other like crap that's going on in the schools up here. Mm-hmm. And, and they're coming and it was Connecticut was ground zero for that. Like that was where they first went after parents in Connecticut. And, and it was, I mean, the, the, the DOJ has been weaponized against we, the people as well as um, political opponents, of course, recently as well. But as we've seen with all the new leaks on all the new papers. And, yeah, all uh, of it. And the latest things that uh, Elon Musk is sharing yeah. about the unfettered access to, twi- the tw- to Twitter. Yeah. And wow. all the social media bigwigs, basically, it's, I'm sure mm. Facebook, Meta, whatever. It's crazy. But, um, you brought up an interesting point, masking, you know. Um, a lot of the incumbents and school board members, um, saying Garrett Linker, but he didn't, he wasn't even there for that. But in Prosper, um, we're totally for mandatory masking. Uh, make sure your kids are masked, you know. Um, Brainwashed. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, 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 what are Do you want to hear my, my point nurse, on masking? I would yeah. love to hear your point. I'll tell you on. all about it. <laughs> when the federal government mandates a mask, they have to also mandate training to use it and fitting. Right. So as a nurse, I've been trained to use a mask and I've been fitted with my mask every year. And I got a little certificate that was on my made to be on my badge, Really? carried it around. It was like attached to the back of my badge. Yeah. And, um, so I'm a size small of the N95 mask. Okay. And so what they do is they put you in a kind of like a little space suit. And so you're, you've got like a clear hood over you that comes over your shoulders and there's like a little valve in there. And so there's um, like an employee health nurse that's, you know, and you're being fitted with this. So you put the mask on. There's a certain certain way you put it. So a true N95 mask does not go around your ears, by the way. Mm-hmm. It's got two straps. One comes over the top of your head and one goes in the back of your head. Yep. So you have a, a full fit around your face. Right. Right. And then you put the hood on and she has this aerosol spray that's got a flavor and it's got a smell. And if you can, and so she sprays it inside the hood. If you can lick your lips and taste the taste, it's like a strawberry or something. I never tasted it, but she would tell me this is what you... Because you know how to put a mask on. <laughs> well... Well, you're properly fitted. I was probably pro- it properly it. fitted. Right, right. And then, uh, so if you can smell it or taste it, you have to let her know, and then you have to do it again with a different size mask. Mm. And then she teaches you how to take them off. You know, this is every year for a fully trained ICU nurse, but whatever, it's all good. But that's the, that's the requirement. If you're required to wear a mask, and I've been in untold amount of tuberculosis rooms uh you have to wear these n95 masks well even in t- for tuberculosis which is a, an airborne bacteria which are large particles compared to teeny little viral particles right. those masks are only 95 percent effective yeah. so the idea is to get in and get out you want to get your mask on gown up get in and do your work and get out of there as quickly as possible to you know prevent that that five percent from you know affecting you 
Well, um, we, we, the CDC came out and said masks don't work after all well, that Well, sure. Hullabaloo. Well, think about the little t-shirt mask and people, that people were wearing. Oh, I went, those cloth oh, ones? Those, yeah. yeah. I walked into work. <laughs> so during the COVID thing, I was in Fort Worth, and they've got this little spice shop that I was in. And just, in, you know, just without really thinking about it, I have it. I picked it up to smell the little sample to see if it's something I wanted to buy. And, I'm, and of course, I could smell it just perfectly. And it just reminded me of that fitting. <laughs> if you can smell it or taste it, you know, and here we are breathing in the scent molecules. But yeah. um, but the mask is supposed to be helpful, you know, against a teeny little viral. Part. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, mean, it was just it another. It goes right through them. It was just mm-hmm. another way, like, hey, can we control people? Like, it's a t- it was a test. Yeah. It was a test. It was it's a test taco to see bueno if we could control people. Where the fountain drink goes right through their hand. Anyway. I, I get, like, I see people <laughs> that terrible. still wear them. And you I'm remember like, that thing? No. This stuff, it goes right through me. What is it, Taco Bueno? Taco Bueno commercial. See, I didn't even know Taco Bueno was a thing until I moved down here, and I see him everywhere, and I'm like, what is this Taco Bueno? I don't know why I thought of that. They used to have this hand puppet. They had, like, the the eyes, yeah, you know, and the little oh, hand yeah. puppet, and he'd hold himself up to a, a soda dispenser, you know, and, he, and it'd go right through his mouth, and he'd say, this stuff, it goes right through me. I like that. Uh, it was ridiculous. Yeah. I don't know why I just thought of that, but there you go. So, um, so... Given us a lot of reasons why you're uh, you're why running. I'm running, yeah. Um, which I mean, it's just a big bowl of mud. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but you know, kudos to you for running. I think I think it's great. And well, I, I think it was we need an empty seat. Like you that are right. That will it was do an this. empty seat, and uh, and Mark Hill had put his uh, you know name in the hat before I did. But I, you know, I took a look at things, and I'm like, well, you know, I'm going to go for it because yeah. I'm a mother, I'm a parent in the district. Unlike my opponent, I've got some skin in the game. And, you know, I know acutely I'm aware of what's going on in the district, Mm. just from my personal experience and from all of my contacts that I've got in the community and what's, you know, being reported to me just through the years, really. And especially since this past year and a half, since I've become so vocal about, you know, really this injustice that was done to my child. Mm -hmm. And, um, but what makes me, um, I would say, uniquely qualified I think I would be the only medical professional potentially in history to be on the school board in Frisco. Oh, wow. Really? Think about that. We've got a fentanyl crisis going on. Yeah. Don't you think that would come in handy? Absolutely. And to have that discernment and critical thinking skills. Absolutely. I Mm -hmm. agree with that. Right. We've, uh, yeah, we've interviewed some, uh, it seems like a lot of nurses are always donating their time and uh, and your job is, is a servant uh, occupation essentially not essentially it is qualifies you yeah yeah but uh yeah i'm just shocked that there's never been uh, there may have been i'm just not aware of one really so. oh, okay mm-hmm. that's crazy mm-hmm. I, I would definitely be the only medical professional on the board right now currently right mm-hmm. um so you've list you've rattled off a bunch of issues <laughs> um and reasons and um qualifications has have you received any like endorsements, yes. uh, donations, things like that, that we should know about? I don't have any, any donations other than just family and friends. Okay. So, but I've received a lot of endorsements that I'm so proud of. Okay. So, um, I'm, I'm a Denton County. I'm, I live on the Denton County side, you know, Frisco sits in Denton County and Collin County. Yep. So Denton Virginia. County Sheriff, our beloved Denton County Sheriff, Tracy Murphy has endorsed me. And this is secondary to a, a fentanyl, um, uh, conversation or rather it was a, it was a, like a, a meeting with a group of um, citizens that he was describing how this is coming into our society and into our, across our Texas borders from China and just devastating communities. Mm-hmm. And so it was more of a community alert that he was doing. And so I got to have some input from someone who's actually worked with the drug and, you know, and I understand how the drug works neurologically. And um, so we can get into that if you want to, but well, now I heard, I don't mean to, Mm-hmm. interrupt your flow but I, i've heard that there is now a new version of fentanyl uh that is not uh doesn't respond to the narcan? Uh, narcan shot i haven't heard that yet okay so i heard that uh, my wife actually told me about this she saw something about it um that they were talking about this is like a new one that's been produced that now doesn't respond to narcan so um it's just something i thought about when you were talking about it and there's a i guess in north texas there was a plano father and son team that basically ran the fentanyl uh drug dealing um the gallegos and they've basically fled back to mexico 
but uh, they were they were dealing, I guess, uh, I don't know, five point seven million in sales of fentanyl and other drugs over roughly a year and a half. Uh, just tons and tons of fentanyl, essentially. But so what fentanyl does is it um, it will essentially what it does to the victim is it will you know it says it's a synthetic opioid, so it will you know relax you, you'll fall asleep, and you forget to breathe. So you're, it it depresses your respiratory drive is essentially what it does. Mm-hmm. So one thing that all my patients in the ICU have in common, they're on a ventilator because they will fall asleep and then they're they'll essentially forget to breathe, yeah. you know, and uh, they're just slowly their respiratory rate will get lower and lower. Or let's say they come in from the OR and maybe they've had too much morphine or something or Dilaudid or whatever, whatever they're taking the OR for, you know, pain for whatever. And their respiratory rate's low. And so I'm monitoring the respiratory rate and I'm seeing that it's, you know, falling and, and uh, they would be on a ventilator. Um, but, you know, we can't, we just can't have that, you know, um, you know, you would want to, um, you know, to observe and to watch, but if they're not on a ventilator and they're um, and they're having, you know, a, a depressed respiratory drive, that's an absolute medical emergency. And so, they would that patient would probably be um, ventilated, and or essentially given the Narcan, you know, simultaneously maybe to pop them out of it. Mm-hmm. So if they're going to come out in pain, you want you want to be careful because the Narcan will it will completely reverse the effects of the opioid. And so if they if they had some sort of trauma or something, you don't want to, mm-hmm. you know get that totally out of their system because it will make it dissipate, the opioid dissipate. And here's, here's yeah, it's a, all about dosing, they'll, right? They'll wake up in pain. Yeah, yeah. Right. here's a report. Uh, this is from the DEA there. Uh, so xylazine has been um, combined with fentanyl. Is that the veterinary? Uh, that's the veterinary drug? That's the know, one. That one works on the heart. That it's one will stop opi- the heart. It's not an opioid. So Narcan does not reverse its effects. Um, but... Uh, 23, it sounds like in the DEA lab system is reporting it in 22, approximately 23% of fentanyl powder and 7% of fentanyl pills seized by the DEA contained xylazine. Uh, and the uh, 66% of those deaths involving synthetic opioids like fentanyl, uh, in, um, uh, I'm sorry, 107,000 Americans died between August 21 and August 22 from drug poisonings with 66% of those deaths involving synthetic opioids like fentanyl. And it sounds like they're mixing this xylazine with fentanyl. I mean, the, the only this is what my wife and I were talking about. There's, there's no, when when you know when I was growing up, kids would like look to get high by smoking weed, right? Maybe they'd like get a little cocaine and like they'd get high off that, drink some beers. That was just and and drug dealers were just dealing that. And, and it's, it's bad, but it's not like fentanyl is designed to, I mean, it's there to kill. Mm -hmm. Um, Fentanyl with xylazine is there to kill, right? These, these, whether it's coming from China, Mexico, wherever, Mm -hmm. they are doing this to kill our kids. And because they know kids are going to look for a high, they know they're going to chase that next drug, that that, what's the next cool drug. And who knows what, are they going to be mixing this powder with, ecstasy pills or whatever else these kids are chasing their they're, high from. They're vaping it too. And they're, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, they're vaping it too. And these kids are going to die and they know that these kids are going to look for this stuff. And and they, there's no other reason for them to do it other than they're trying to kill these kids. Right. Well, you can take a little bit of fentanyl, right? You can, you can definitely do that. And it will, it will, it's cheaper, right? So it's cheaper than the cocaine or whatever they're cutting. It's it way cheaper, and that's and, why they're oh, cutting it into like right. let's say an oxycontin type of pill. That's why they're doing it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're really trying. I mean, maybe they're trying to kill, but I don't know if all of them are trying to kill them. I just know that when my wife gave birth to my youngest, who's almost seven months old now, she got a uh, drip right uh, in her in her spinal cord, right? Like uh, I forgot what it is. You know, but morphine. No, but I forgot what it is. But um, in that drip, it was fentanyl. Right? Oh, really? Because I read the the prescription essentially that was on that drip, and I was like, fentanyl. You're mm. giving her fentanyl? Oh my gosh! And they're like, oh yeah. I mean, a little bit of fentanyl, it's great. Um, well, under medical supervision, I'm sure it's okay. Right. It's all but, about dosing, essentially. Right. But the problem is, is you have 
people mixing cocaine and opioids or whatever with fentanyl on their own, and they don't know how to mix it right mm-hmm. proportionately to. Well, their that's kind of where I'm standards. going with like the the influx of of fentanyl, either in powder or pill form from China or Mexican cartels. It's it has. <laughs> They're doing it to kill people. I think they're so. not doing it to get kids hooked on cocaine. They're like it. Cocaine's addictive enough, right? If they want to get people can get addicted, why not just use baby powder and cut it with baby powder like they've been doing for decades? Why all of a sudden are they just throwing <laughs> fentanyl? Don't in give there? them that idea. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. but that is, but that's the thing. Like, they're 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 do they. There's no other way. There's no other reason, in my opinion, that, that they would be doing it with fentanyl other than to kill people. Yeah, I don't and know. The, the, it's a it's a war on the youth of America. I think they're I definitely trying to opinion. kill people for sure. I, I, I also agree. think they're trying to get cheap and make more money. They're, it's yeah. all about money, but yeah, they don't care. They don't care who they yeah, kill. They don't. they don't care who they kill. Oh. So Sheriff Murphy was one of my um, endorsements. That is nice. one of my endorsements that I'm so so proud of. That's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Allen West. Awesome. I love yep. Allen West. I love oh Alan man, West. I would love to meet him. He's awesome. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, he believes strongly that our school boards have got to be reined in. We've got to get our school boards under control for these children. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, besides that, um, let's see. So I've got a lot of groups, including Collin County GOP. Right. They unanimously endorsed me. Very proud of that. Very, yeah. very proud. And, uh, and then Denton County Conservative Coalition. Um, so I've been endorsed by Denton County, Collin County. And then there's tons of groups like um, Restore the Republic, Red Wave Texas, uh, True Texas Project, um, lots of lots of lots of conservative groups like that. And I'm CCDF. Conf- oh, CCDF. Yes, it's thank a great you. Organization. Yep, Love yep, them. yep. Mm-hmm. And then um, so there's a pack called Families for Frisco. Very proud to have their endorsement. Nice. And so there's no money involved, but they've got you know it's it's a name. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if it's a name with a reach, that's what right. you need. It's a group of people. Yeah. Yeah, and they they stand for you know children's rights and parental rights and doing what's right and you know standing up and they're it's a Christian Christian group so I feel very happy about that mm-hmm. nice. I'm very proud and uh, and Should then be. there's um, individuals also who aren't necessarily uh, conservative or liberal they're you know th- what I'm saying is they're both and so um, so I'm getting endorsements from both sides of the That's spectrum great. so That's great proud. to hear there's mm-hmm. a huge um, uh, Indian population in Frisco, right? That's like, who I was thinking. That's one of one of my endorsements that I was so so proud of. Yeah, mm-hmm. several. They have they have a very like minded community mm-hmm. um, with uh, a lot of the values that we share. Right, family values. Yes, family values. Mm-hmm. So. Yes, education. They put education really. They they kind of chuckle and say even before we put food on the table, like they care about it because education is what puts food on the table. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And w- the difference with that group though versus like let's say my family. Is they we should follow their their lead. Is they supplement education outside of the school. So while you've got um, the here's just a, a statistic that might shock you, in Frisco, across the board, the student population has mastered reading at fifty percent five zero fifty percent, and that's a little bit up through the COVID years. It's it's increased so it's up to fifty from like forty four percent. And that's. So go back to me being a nurse. How would you like to be struggling to breathe that I'm 50% competent in my skill? Seriously. Well, you just get a second chance, second, third chance, right? <laughs> yeah. Right, I mean, right. It's like we're just playing Pac-Man, right? Just get <laughs> nine lives. What yeah. are you? Mm-hmm. We're cats. It's kind of sad. But the reason why it's up to 50% is because we've got these populations who are supplementing their education outside of school. Weekends, after school, work, work, work. And their their numbers are skyrocketing. They're they're way like 80%, you know, competent in their, you know, skills at least um, versus, you know, other groups that are way low, but you average them out and we've got a 50% group, 50% that can master reading at grade level in Frisco across all grades. Mm. Do you, um, uh, what's my question? Oh, do you have a, a handle on like how many people actually vote in these school board elections in Frisco? Cause we the intis- numbers, I was surprised to hear in Prosper, the numbers are actually quite low. It's low. It's around 15%. Okay. Mm-hmm. 15% of 225,000. What, what's that? Let's get that. That's 
almost 20 40, to, so about 40, no, no, no. 000. Then it's less. Yeah. No, no, no. That's so like it's 35. 000. I know last year. Okay, so my 15 is coming. Last year we had around 15,000 votes. Okay, 15,000 votes. This year we anticipate a little bit more. So, so maybe it's be maybe the six, six, seven and a half. Maybe the 15 percent will might be accurate this year. I doubt it though. Um, people just don't come out to vote for these, you know. But we've got I mean, a mayoral, it's in the mayoral race. Year is what we heard, right? I think it's a couple thousand people. Oh, is it really that many? Okay. Last year we had around 15,000 voters that came out for school board races, but we didn't have the mayor election that we've got this year and uh, the city council. So okay. we've got that going on. So we'll have more voters more this numbers. year. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I was just curious um, about about that because, you know, obviously, I mean, I heard our numbers are low and I, I just wasn't sure about how it compared in Frisco. Yeah, people are, you know, some someone else will handle it. Someone else will, you know, take care of things. And well, that's the thing, right? A lot of people are like, oh, somebody else will do it, mm -hmm. right? Until, you, like, that's one of the reasons why we started the podcast. It's like someone else will talk about the issues. Someone else will talk about what's going on mm -hmm. in, you know, the local, you know, local politic arena or in, you know, the, the not so mainstream news that people right. aren't paying attention to. Uh, someone else will share things about world history, U.S. history that you don't read or learn about in school anymore. Um, well, maybe there just needs to be more gender uh, books in the library, you know, because what happened with Susan, uh, right, is, you know, your son <laughs> showed you this book. Yeah. And it just blindsided you Game and lit numbers. this fire yeah. in your, it inside did. you, right? It did. To You're do right. something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it doesn't They should really be ripping matter. those books out of the library, right? Yeah. Let's yeah, get no, them out. Just put them in, you know, and, like, send them home to these parents. Flood and maybe the to, like, with gender finally get these people, these these parents woke up, you know, right. like you got woke up, yeah. you know, cause it doesn't really matter if it happens to somebody across town, you know, like whatever, it didn't happen to me, but when it happens to you and your child and your home, that will get you awake. Yeah. Maybe more people need to wake up. Maybe it just isn't bad enough yet. Yeah. Maybe that's why we don't have enough voters coming out to vote for people like Susan and Reed and Amy Boots and the rest of them. Yeah, you know I mean? more, like, more pain. People need to feel, like people don't respond until they feel the pain. Mm -hmm. And then when you feel the yeah. pain, when, the, when it hits you at home and hard. you start to feel the pain, mm -hmm. that's when you take action. When you get so pissed off because of something, yeah. that's when it, it makes you, like pain is a great motivator and a great mm -hmm. teacher. And yeah. it, and it, it drives you to avoid that pain next time around. Yep. And so when you feel the pain at home, then you're like, wait a minute, like somebody's got to do something about this and nobody's doing anything about this. And so, you know what, like I'm this upset, I'm going to be the one who goes and does something about this. Yeah. So kudos to you for doing something <laughs> about you. it. So what can people do for you to help you in your campaign, aside from obviously getting out and voting for you, um, what could they do for you, for, for all the listeners out here? Uh, well, come to my website. I'm at Susan for Frisco ISD place com. That's one. So I've got volunteering and we've got donations. Um, I'm raising money to place ads. So there's that. Um, okay. these are not cheap and I'm self-funded. So, and I, I have had some, some donations. So I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, struggling, struggling to get these things done, but I'm, I'm still putting out signs. I'm still buying, you know, materials and still, and I'm just getting into the ads. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yep. So you got block walking and please volunteer. Yes. Yeah. So when you come onto my site and you sign up for the volunteer area, um, we'll put your sign, our sign in your yard. And then um, we'll also put you on an email list and you can come and volunteer and we block walk. Uh, we'll pole greet. Um, I got a t-shirt for you to wear and you can be my walking advertisement everywhere you go and just let everyone know, you know, we've got Susan Kershaw here, we've got 67,000 children to save is what we're doing. And it is a group effort. I've got a, a nice team of moms who are supporting me and dads and grandparents, like I said, and we're, we're doing everything that we can. So just to let the listeners know and the viewers know, this is something I'm doing for the children. My goal, you want to know why I'm running for the kids. I have no political aspirations, no financial aspirations. I'm not trying to, I will not make a dime on this. You know, this is something that I cannot benefit from except for doing the right thing for the school, for the children, and to teach my children what integrity looks like. That's noble. 
That's noble. I love it. So your website, just so uh, for all the listeners and viewers, it's www.susan, S-U-S-A-N, the number four, Frisco, F-R-I-S-C-O, I-S-D, place five, the number five, dot com. That's it. All right. Um, and then, yeah, you can go, you can check out more, uh, information about Susan. She's got an about me page, uh, with some information about her, her background, her family. Uh, there's a, lo- a link to donate on there and, um, anything else you want to say or just thank, thank you to everyone who's been supportive of me and this really this, um, large, um, you know, um, fantastic, um, m- movement that we've got going, uh, to support the schools and to support the children and the families of Frisco. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, I say that I'm a leader. I've, I've been a leader in different measures and different ways um, in, in different areas in my life. But right now I'm the leader of a massive movement to clean up our schools. And I just really appreciate the opportunity to really to be a part of this campaign and to give a voice if I if I may be so bold um, if when election day comes along and I get this seat to be the voice of the families at Frisco and the children even and the uh, the students you know and the families and the community as a whole and the business leaders that um, that need a voice that are being silenced and I, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to come and talk to you guys and and thank my supporters I've got a lot of signs out there and I've got more to go and um, I've, I've had a lot of support and I'm just, I'm, I'm flattered and humbled and grateful. Well, thank you for running. It's a uh, it's true service, you know, and thanks for joining us here on the dudes talk of freedom podcast. We love listening and having conversations uh, with, uh, people like you, you know, because, uh, you're the people that make big change in our communities and that's where it starts. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. All right, dudes and dudettes, that's a wrap for this episode of Dudes Talking Freedom. Special thank you goes out to Susan Kershaw, Frisco ISD, Place 5, Board of Trustees candidate, for joining us in studio tonight. Again, to learn more about Susan or to donate to her campaign, visit her website, www.susanforfriscoisdplace5.com. The website can also be found in our show notes. Best of luck to you at the polls, Susan. And for DTF, this is Jeremy. This is Luke. And we'll see you next time.